Hey guys, it's Spadoodle. Uh, you can always go to davidspade.com to look at my tour dates because I bless a lot of cities in America with my hilarious stand-up act. Or you could not go to it and get on my enemy list. Up to you. You guys, today is Joe Piscopo. Now, people have asked us to have on different people. You know, we've had so many people on, but Joe Piscopo is one of the OGs. And I hate to say, when you say his name, usually people say, oh, he was back in the Eddie Murphy days. And he was Eddie Murphy's probably best friend. Um, and I, I think they're still very close. But that was back in that era. So it was after the first five years. And then there was a couple of uh, grumbly years and getting on their feet. But he was there when he and Eddie were tearing it up. And he was huge. He did a great job on the show. He has so many funny stories. He's just very good at telling stories. Um, and he really brings it. He knows how to talk. He knows how to entertain you. He used to do impressions. We do a few of those. Of course, Dana jumps in on those. And uh, just a very, very likable guy and a very humble guy. And we had a great time talking to him. So without further ado, here we go, Joe Piscopo. Joe has left the Zoom. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Um, I got you. Except I can't see. I got something saying record by staying in this meeting. Okay, I consent. Got it. Okay. There's my man. Yeah. Dana. That's right. Are we record, are we recording now or is this? Yep. Like We're always recording. Chat? We don't have any intro. We're not like professional. <laughs> we don't say here's our guest or anything. No. <laughs> we just go. Where's David? Where'd David go? I'm right here. Do you see me? There you are, baby. How are you, man? I'm right at the bottom of the screen. I don't know. Look why. at his stuff. Hey. Look at his stuff. I got to tell you, David, can I start? Dana crushed it at, at an event on Friday night. He was out there and it was like 800, close to 1,000 baseball players who just wanted to talk like baseball. Right. <laughs> Dana goes, Dana go, and a lot of folks have done the event and haven't done really well, great. So Dana mm -hmm. goes, how's it going to be, Joe? And I go, it's going to be great. I gave him one of those. It's yeah. going to be great. And you and you you nailed it, uh, Eddie. You nailed yeah, I was, it. I was, I was, you, I was off. I lost my notes. Did you find them? I lost my notes. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't know where I was. I felt bad about that one for a while. But afterwards, Joe, being what? very nice, said, "Did you tell him to like our producer Matt?" He goes. Everyone has a tough time here, even Seinfeld, you know, so I didn't know the bar was low, but yeah, it was a little extremely nice people, but the room went way back and there was a lot yeah. of chatter because yeah. it's a cocktail yeah. party. You know, yeah. Yeah. you yeah. were you playing to a pre-tape? You had a band. I was just off to the side. So you come out and sing. No, New York you, a little of both. We had a live band there, okay. but I cranked what you heard. What you heard was a pre-tape. We cranked it up to make it easier. But that's also. And with the, but I did put, I put the live girls on stage. David, I've turned into the Wayne Newton of comedy. Thank you. That's and fine. so I just got the girls, got the girls singing with me on stage. It was a whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun though, man. Listen, I love it. I've done those kind of corporate gig or a charity gig. I did one just up in Calgary. They wound up being yeah. very nice, but you know, it's always a crapshoot. You just don't know. They, they have other things in their mind. Yeah. And if you're exactly. a surprise while they're eating their steak, they go, it's been an eight hour meeting. And now <laughs> we're going to hold you hostage for one more hour while we're here. And they go, Stevie Nicks, David Spade. Oh, I heard it was Stevie Nicks. Yeah. I always say, when did they get up? 6 a.m. for the breakfast meeting. When did the open yeah. bar start? At four. When do <laughs> I go Wait, on? I got 11. <laughs> okay. All right. 11 at night. <laughs> So, so I got to tell you, David, so, so we, I always, when I MC, like back in the days when I started at the improv a hundred years ago, yeah. before you young people were born, you know, we want to know that. I would always, yeah. Story. Yeah. No, but I was, I would always be uh, cognizant and responsible to who's on stage. Cause it's your, your job to get the crowd going and then hand it off, you know? Mm -hmm. So I felt that way with Dana particularly, you know, so I'm going like, okay, so we start the whole thing. And it's going great. The data comes out and I go, wow, he's really working. He's working with the crowd. It's great. And now he's going to close. And then we're going to start the night in the awards. Yeah. And we're going to close. It. And then he picks up his guitar, strums the guitar. It's dead as, <laughs> as, as, as the door. Dead. Ah. He can't get And I'm going, oh, man. So I'm off stage. It's yeah. dead. It's, I'm off stage. I'm going. So I go to the guy with the headphones, my, my buddy Jordan. I go, so I call the back of the room, man. His, his monitor's out. I'm not getting anything. At all. And they couldn't figure it out. And I said, give me the mic. Give me the mic. So they gave me the mic. So I walked out on stage yeah. and I held my microphone. 
Next to Data Smart. Guitar, and I was just my stand. Well, you know what? You helped and out. And then you had, a, you had a great one-liner at that point because you're kind of bending down. Actually, you placed the mic perfectly. I don't know if you'd know that to get some volume because it was a short. What I do. And then it's what, what Joe do. said was, this is. A career highlight for me. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Big laugh, big, big laugh from Uncle Joe. I, I like that. It was great. But I tell you, it was great. It, it was great, you know, and, and it was fun. And thank, thanks. Dude. Yeah. Well, th that. thank you, yeah. Frank. I mean, Joe. I Joe, uh, <laughs> sometimes those gigs are contractually like 60 minutes and they. And that's why, like, if Dana is short five minutes, you sometimes have to go do something extra, even if you're killing, because you might get off 99% of the time. They said, great. We didn't even need that long. You did great. But sometimes yeah. they go, we paid you for an hour. You did 54. And you go, oh, my God. It, it's all but, it's all flip. They said they said 45. And then they sent me a text the day of the show and said, really apologizing, saying, you, could you do just 30? Because when I when Joe was backstage, he goes, "What are you going to do? Twenty twenty five? You know?" Because it, like I said, we're we're an aperitif. We're not the show. But then mm -hmm. later they said, "Well, if you feel it, go longer." I don't know how long I did, but anyway, Joe was there, Power got dirty. to hang did you, out. Oh, did you? Yeah. Did you did you look at your phone while you're on stage? You glanced at to make sure you had the time, right? Did you? Did I see you do that? You were just I saw you had a phone on stage. You, you were I must have lost a sense of time. I don't remember. <laughs> you know, once I. Cause my guitar thing is like I'm I'm going all over the stage. It, I'm in the zone. It's really loud. It's like it, for a for a room that's a little unsettled. It's a big closer. And then when it's like, uh oh, it happens about every one every <laughs> twenty shows. Like, oh, there's a short. It's not going to be amplified. So I just sort of froze until you rescued me, folks. We the Joe Pescopo has been our guest today, and yep. this is uh, about an event we did. <laughs> no. So can we go back just for a second to the how yep. you. Just a little out of bog. We know that your time on SNL at eighty, but you're like you're very young when you get on the show. What did? How did that happen so quick? Right? Are you? What? What? what, what yeah. Tell us that little journey. Uh, I think I was about twenty six, twenty seven when we hit, man. And I, I, you know, I went to the improv. And, and tell me if I talk too long, man. Love you guys. By the way, with great respect, you Dana, to you David, great respect for you guys because you you held a great legacy of SNL and. You know, and you. and uh, just so proud to be with you here, and 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 it's it's really cool to be with you, you know. And but I got, but what I did, I I just wanted to be a working stiff, you know. But I went to the improvisation because I heard that they have like comedy nights, that, just like all of us did. Mm -hmm. This was in New York. It was Forty Fourth and Ninth. Mm -hmm. It was Hell's Kitchen. It was back in the seventies when New York was a million times even worse than now. It was terrible. You could, I mean, you. I, I remember distinctly walking from the parking you know, a lot where I parked the car. And then I walked down a uh, 44th street and there were like, you know, bodies and police lines, you know what I mean? In New York, and I go, oh, that's good. Somebody got whacked, you know, it was, like, but it was like that. It was, no, it was like that. So, so then I said, well, let me try at least try it. So I remember I went in the first night it was audition night and, 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 you know, God, you guys are young, young. And it was like, I went back then that is when comedy was rock and roll. It was, I tell you, all of a sudden comedy just came into its own. And I went, I got to try that. I just wanted to get on stage and then be a working stiff. Let somebody, somebody hire me to do the third, fourth lead in an hour, you know, episodic. That's all sure. I wanted to do. Yeah. You know? Get on so, a fucking so mat walk. <laughs> <laughs> Great reference. And that's exactly what I was thinking. The bar wasn't too high for me, David. What am I going to tell you? You know, so, so not to take anything away from Matt Lock. So I go in, I came in Lincoln Tunnel, came around, going down Ninth Avenue. I looked down at the improv. There had to be 400 people jammed like it was like Times Square in Hell's Kitchen. Jammed. And I looked and I said, oh, I panicked. And I went right back into the Lincoln Tunnel and went right back home, totally chickened out. Then I came back. Hmm. And I and when people had to just start out, we used to have to get there because everybody wanted to do comedy at the time. 12 noon, 12 noon. And at 8 o'clock, roughly 8.30, the improv would come out, Judy Orbach would come out and she would hand out numbers. So to see when you would be on. So you, if you got there earlier, like at noon, you could, you could kind of go, all right, I'm on third. And then each week, me, Gilbert Gottfried, uh, Alan Combs was there. Larry David was there. Jerry came later, but we would jockey numbers around, you know, to see when you would go on and you would get your five minutes, man, your five minutes. And it was the most petrifying thing in the world. And I did that for about six weeks. And then I finally, 
uh, got, I, for some reason, they put me up and it worked, you know, and Chris Albrecht, you know, gave me this, he got this, you know, he got me this, you know, HBO, was he the HBO? It's just an uh, agent. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and one of the great ex- television executives ever club manager and owner with Bud Friedman and Silver Friedman back in the late seventies. I, did, I didn't know that. I didn't know. And that. he was That's my great. agent in the eighties, Chris Albrecht. He Chris was, Albrecht right? was? He, oh, yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. Before HBO. He was the guy. Yeah. Like, we used to call we used to call him the general because we used to play guys, we used to play it's I, I, there's gotta be a film or a documentary about it. We used to play softball. We were all Yankee fans. We'd go to Central Park and then and then and then Larry was there. Larry David was there. And, she, and Larry was then just the way he is now, you know, completely <laughs> neurotic, you know. And he would just be there and he would say the most brilliant things. When Larry went on stage, when finally I became a regular and we used to have to work out and you'd get up at one, two in the morning. When Larry went on stage, everybody would just rush to the little opening that led to the showroom, which was about a couple hundred people. And we would watch Larry and he would he would get into fights with the audience like you hear about. It, it was true. Mm-hmm. So he would get in with his attitude and start fighting back and forth. It was, but it was genius. It was, And everybody knew Larry is a genius. And then I can remember distinctly, we would play softball. And then uh, I was playing third base. Larry was playing shortstop. And and then I could hear Larry. And, uh, and we're waiting. And, you know, the, the, the game is on. I hear Larry going, oh, oh. <laughs> he's, like, you know, he's like miserable. About it. He's <laughs> like, in the middle of the game. And I go, and, I'm, and I got to keep my eye on the batter because I'm in the hot corner. I go, Larry, what, what happened? Ah, I stepped, I stepped a dog shit. I, I stepped a dog do. I stepped in dog shit. What'd you do? He goes, I, I threw away my shoes. I have no shoes. And this was a legitimate conversation <laughs> with Larry David. The time. The time An the episode time of was, Curb, yeah. Exactly, exactly. It was exactly right. So it was, it was bizarre. But then, then we got, uh, we heard that SNL was leaving and John Belushi and uh, Danny would come hang out at the clubs, particularly Catch Rising Star. The comedy clubs were, uh, it was Hell's Kitchen, and then it was the Upper East Side was Catch, mm-hmm. even before the comic strip. But they and, had blown up, Joe, so those are two monster stars coming in. Yeah, yeah you know, yeah, exactly right. So, they, okay. no, But we didn't know. When they first went on the air, we were all working Saturday night uh, oh, live. Oh, okay. We were, they, we, you know, we were working on Saturday nights, and we didn't even know. And I remember being at the bar at Catch Rising Star, and I go, uh, how you doing? And nice as ever, it was John Belushi. Yeah, hey, John Belushi, hey, I'm on new show Saturday Night Live. And Danny Ackroyd right there. The times were nuts, man. Patty Benatar down by the bar, you know. It was crazy. But then then we heard they left, and they were leaving, and they needed a new cast. And I and and I didn't want anything to do with it because you couldn't replace the original cast. You just couldn't. I mean, it was Gilda and oh, Danny Ackroyd. Yeah. And it was, it was Chevy and, and, and John, and you mm-hmm. couldn't do it. And I didn't want to do it. So long, long story short, even longer than this. Take your time. I had a friend who was, <laughs> no, there was, a, there was a, a writer named John DeBellis. And John was hired by Gene Domanian, who was the new producer, Lauren's former right hand. And I don't know what happened politically there, but Gene was running the show. And, and Gene said, I need a utility guy. And John said, I know Joe Piscopo is at the clubs. He does characters and voices. She goes, bring him up. So I went right up to the 17th floor and I auditioned for Jean. And 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 she, I heard she used like Woody Allen as a reference because she and Woody were very close. Yes. So, 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 I, so I did the audition and they go, okay, you could now do the big audition. And I go, what? And they did a sweep of that town. NBC came in and they swept the town and the big buzz Data, the big buzz was like, who's going on SNL? Who's going to replace the, the original sure. cast? Yeah. So, and everybody was scared and they wanted to do it. I said, I don't know, but I don't want to do it. I want to just keep doing what I'm doing. I was doing commercials. Mm-hmm. I was doing, you know, like like comedy clubs, and I was doing great. That and that that was my that was my career high, Dana, for real. You know, I got it. So, so, so That's then good. then they go, okay, now you got to go to the regular audition. And I go to the regular audition, and it was me, uh, and there was some great talented people. That Gilbert was there, Paul Rubens was there. He did. Oh. He was there when I was. Uh-huh. There. And, yep, yep. <laughs> 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 so, can I ask you one question, Joe? How many yeah. years were you doing stand up before nineteen eighty? Was it five years, six years? Yeah. And you had, Four and, and, and you had, at one point, knew you were, could do impressions and voices. You had that kind of yeah. Uh, yeah. style. Yeah. Okay. 
So then, yeah. then you then you got noticed. Now you don't want the show. So, but you got you're gonna. But do it's perf. It's perfect for the show. But you don't want it. So then what? No, so then what know, happens? Freaking, <laughs> well, no, no, no. We do, so we do the audition, and then they go, okay, we want to hire you. So Chris calls me. Albrecht calls me. You got the part. You're gonna be the utility guy, you know. And I'm going, I, Chris, and I remember arguing with him because I was making good money. I, you know, I joined uh, SAG and AFTRA, and I was, I just, and I said, you can't replace. Belushi and Aykroyd, please don't make me do it. And, and Chris was, he was the boss back then to, to all of us young guys. And, and he, and listen, he was our age too. But I said to him, all right, man, I'll go in, but I don't feel good about this. You feel like it's so, no win, right? You know what? And you know what, David, I don't want to say nothing, but I was, I was right kind of, uh, we did 10 shows, N- nobody's fault. You just couldn't replace America's sure. favorite television show. One of the greatest television shows of all time. The writing of Alan Zweibel, the writing of Herb Sargent, you know, Franken and Davis. You couldn't replace that. And we didn't. And But Jean Domania was great. I remember I went up. She said, you're in. She hired Gilbert. She hired a couple other people. And then there was a kid. And he's up there on 17th floor in the back, you know, uh, off of Lauren's office. There was a little sitting area. And, and I, and I uh, said, they said, Joe, this is Eddie Murphy. I said, hey, Eddie, how you doing? We from Long Island. Never heard of him, never knew him. We hit it off immediately. And they said, yeah, they want me to audition. So I go, I go, all right, what do you want to do, man? I, I, this is exactly the way it happened. And, and he goes, uh, we said, let's do the word association sketch that Chevy and Richard Pryor did. Let's do that. You do Pryor, I'll do Chevy, and we'll do it. So we went, we're in an office. We're upstairs on the 17th floor. And then I, we had the script. And we did the word association, you know, all yeah. as an inappropriate as it was. A famous sketch and, and, where it was incredibly could not do it today, but it was Chevy Chase and Richard Pryor. So you guys re- duplicated that, just met, got the script from people there, and then, re- okay, so what, then what happened? <laughs> Fascinating. Well, it, then, then Eddie just, like, crushed it, man. I mean, he was like, I mean, he crushed And I'm next to him going like, oh, man. So now, now they wait, okay, we'll let you know, like, to Eddie. And I and, and if I remember correctly, and I went into Gene, I said, this kid's the next prior. This kid is the next prior. I said, that was unbelievable. Well, we don't know. NBC thought he was too edgy. They was too edgy. We said no. True. So they made him. They, they, yep. Yeah, yeah, they made him a featured player. You know, which oh, meant, funny. Like, he, and he's 19, right? In 18, 19. Yeah. yeah. 19. Yeah. Which so makes that, sense. That, which makes sense. Yeah. You know, so they brought him in and little mm-hmm. by little, so we did 10 shows. Gilbert was on it. And it just. Nobody's fault. I, I don't want to, and, and I got a I got a big shout out to Billy Mary, the genius of Billy Mary, the heart of Billy Mary, one of the great guys ever. He came in and he came in on, on that new cast and he he guest hosted and that meant a lot. And then he took us out and he all kind of brought us together, but it just didn't work. So so cut to this. And tell me if I'm talking too much because no, I want to lay this out. We, we want so, we want you to talk. This is great. I I knew you'd be a great no, guest, so, and you are. So go ahead. So okay. So no, no, listen. So so then then we go like this. We go. Uh oh. NBC pulled the plug. What happened? It's off. You know. And we were like off the air. I touched shows. I thought I knew this would happen. Say, Chris, I told you. I so so now now they're calling everybody up to the seventeenth floor. Now they replaced Gene Dominion. And by the way, Jean gets credit. She hired me, but she hired, even more importantly, Eddie Murphy. She hired Eddie Murphy. You got to give yep. Gene Domania yep. credit for sure. that. Mm-hmm. Right? Yep. So so now so now they're bringing Dick Ebersole. Ever, Dick Ebersole is legendary. Uh, so Dick Ebersole, you know? no, like he was sort of there with Lauren a little bit in the beginning. He's an NBC. Yeah. How do you, now you guys know the history, man. Listen, Dick Ebersole was the executive at NBC that was with Brandon Tartikoff, yeah. rest his soul. Yeah. Like another great NBC mm-hmm. executive, as, as Ebersol was, as uh, Mr. Ebersol was. And but and then I think I think Dick and Lauren were very close. I think so. That's yeah. the way it happened. So 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 I guess they went to Lauren. They said, "Look, sorry, what do we do now?" And I get I'm I'm, I'm, I'm I don't know. This is conjecture. Mm-hmm. And they brought in Dick. So Dick, we went into Lauren. It was Lauren's office, but Ebersol's there, and he's bringing. And we're I'm sitting out there in the writers' wing, and everybody's. Coming out, and they're all getting whacked, guys. <laughs> it was like this, Everyone's getting, getting whacked. Whacked. Why they they're getting whacked? firing. It was like St. Valentine's Day. They cast. bring you uh, into. They bring you in to fire you. Yeah, they bring. They brought everybody in, whacked one by one. It was oh. like the St. Valentine's Day massacre. Listen. So then I remember Ann Risley, great talent, whacked. Denny Dillon, great talent, whacked. Whacked. They got, got Charlie Rocket, rest his soul. You, 
Rocket used the F, dropped the F-bomb, done, done. Tim, done. Easy Tim whack. Krasinski, was he whacked or kept? No, no, Tim came in oh, later. later. This okay. was like, yeah, this was, they, they, this was a preliminary. Yeah. So now Gilbert, to me, was one of my best friends. Yeah. And we came up together at the clubs. He walked out and he goes, I guess you got fired. You got fired. Uh, and he, I said, you, you, got, you got fired? So now they go, all right, let's get Paul Murphy. Come on in. <laughs> so me and Eddie go in. And me and Eddie had, we had a sets, sets to do at the comic strip or wherever <laughs> we were going. We were, we were, in our heads, that's where we were. So, and we didn't care. And I fed off of the reckless abandon of Eddie Murphy because he just didn't care about anything. It was a beautiful thing to be a part of. So mm -hmm. now we're going into the Lauren's beautiful office. And Dick Eversole is back there like this, you know. And I sit down, and he sits down, and Dick goes like this. Well, Eddie, uh, Joe, we've uh, we've decided to keep you. And we went, I'll never forget, great, Dick, look, we got a couple sets, and we got to make our set if you buy. Hold on. <laughs> we could care less. I think the cockiness helped, guys, you know what I'm saying? Oh, definitely. Yeah. But it was yeah. like, I mean, so so that was it. And then Well, we were you, there. Joe, were you relieved, or were you sort of like, oh, no, I'm stuck on the Titanic? So, oh no, I'm stuck in the Titanic. Yeah, I yeah. Really thought, oh, it wasn't really yeah. helping you at that point. You're like, God, we're just going to sink further in this. I know exactly, exactly. Yeah. But but I got to. But again, a shout out to. I'm sure he leaned on Lorne, but uh, Dick Eversole knew what he was. He said, "You couldn't match, fellas, the um, writing of of the and the genius of the original cast. You just you couldn't match. Hundred percent because that it was a perfect storm. Yeah, with the, the politically." With the with the way Lauren put everything together, yeah, I, it was genius. And whoever was going to follow that original, because they're the original rock stars Take of the hit, comedy, yeah. they were, you know, and then it was impossible right. to follow. I had a buttress of years, but to follow that, hard. And proof is Eddie Murphy. You couldn't scout in the whole country a better guy to that does well on SNL. And was he blowing up at all, or was it still just people just turn the TV off? No, no, we, it started to catch on a, a little bit. You know why? Yeah, you have to give Dick Eversole credit because he bought in entertainment. He said, we can't match the hipness of, of Lauren's original show. Let's just entertain. Let's just be funny. So we took, that was a great lesson. That was, that was, I don't know if Lauren told, you know, Mr. Eversole that, whatever it was, mm -hmm. we went on. And then Eddie and I, out of, I guess, fear and survival, we kind of just, joined together and started writing for ourselves, uh, reaching out to great two great writers, Barry Blaustein, David Sheffield, and they were the key writers for Eddie and I. Tim Kazarinski came in, and Timmy really was the captain of that of that cast. Mm -hmm. He was great. He and Mary Gross came in. Yes. And and we had you know what? We started to gel a little bit, started having some fun a little bit. And and I gotta tell you, I think what maybe probably made it work when Eddie and I were doing the in ones, you know, David, I said to uh, Dana the other night, I said the, the, the great thing that Dana always did, and, and you as well, is that the in ones is what really I thought yeah. sold it. You wanted to see, you wanted to see the church lady. You wanted to see whether for me, uh, the direct to guy, camera, right? right? Yeah, yeah, right, right directly to the camera. We would Single write these silly, yeah, crazy Eddie sketches, you know, whatever it was. And Eddie and I would do the in ones together, or I would do it, and that seemed to gain, you know, some steam. And I go, my people, we go like this. By the grace of God, it worked, you know. It just, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't tell you how. Just, huh? just for a second, because I just, my brain gets curious about this stuff. So, you, how many episodes did you do with Gene Domanian before it was sort of just ten? Just and, ten. And then there's a purge, and then the show starts again in the fall. Was there a gap of it not being on the air? Yeah, there was, was a gap of it not being here. Really canceled. I did not. I did not know. It that. was almost yeah, they, like a funeral and a wake for the first season. Yeah. You know, the great people, and then it's like, okay, they took the hit. The first ten shows. Mm -hmm. Now it's almost like it can't be that bad. You know what I mean? Some something about it. Yeah, and then you and Eddie true. started. For me, being in clubs and being aware of this whole situation, uh, you know, I I felt that you and Eddie kind of were you know, becoming stars, obviously, you know, the two of you, you know, the uh, famous yeah. Sinatra uh, and Eddie doing Stevie Wonder Stevie almost Wonder. as a as dramatic actor, almost like it was very, it shocked yeah. the audience when he started singing. And then your Sinatra, I think is, I mean, there's, I got my Phil Hartman, you, but I think it's right yeah. up there with anybody who's yeah. ever yeah. done it, yeah. Yeah. you know? 
You're 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 yeah. Frank. You know when, yeah. when they they asked me to do the Frank Sinatra early on, I and mean, we we were now we were searching. We were searching. What are we doing? How do we how do we keep going? And and we had the pretty good guests would come on, and then he brought on like like Jerry Lewis came on, which was great. And then he would he would book Don Rickles, and then Sid Caesar, and we went back and, and it was, <laughs> holy I, shit, <laughs> that's big. It, it, it was like it was like let's just get guys that can do this. And then but early on they said Joe, we need the Frank Sinatra character. This was early on. And even during Gene's time, I said, I can't do it because it's a respectful thing and I don't want to make fun of it. I did it in the clubs. I did it for my SNL uh, audition. I said, I can't do it. I, and so I bought it. Then, and the way it goes, I wrote Mr. S a letter because I wanted to be a team player. I wrote Mr. Sinatra a letter and I said, this is done with respect. This, this is the whole Italian New Jersey thing, guys. That's what this no, is about. Well, that's about what I want to hear about because I'm from California. So this is yeah. like... <laughs> It's not dangerous, but you don't want to hurt Frank because for a, someone from New Jersey at that time, right. it's Frank Sinatra. Right. You know, exactly you don't mess right. with Frank and you love Frank. That's right. Yeah. It's exactly. It's respect. Yeah. It's respect. And, and my father said, my father was an attorney, rest his soul. He said, if you're not, you're not going to be a lawyer then, and you want to do entertainment, then look to Frank Sinatra because that's your role model. So here I am doing them. And then they asked me to do them in a, in a satirical way. And I said, I I can't, and because it, it's a, I'm telling you, it's hard to describe, but people, you know, would understand. It's a North Jersey Italian American thing, it's, and it's all about respect. And I told that to Mr. S. So I sent it to Mickey Rudin, his lawyer at the time, and I didn't hear anything back. I said, okay, let's do it. And we did it, but I always couched it. I always was respectful. Matter of fact, that Ebony and Ivory sketch was a, a Barry, Barry and David, uh, uh, Blasty to Sheffield. Eddie and I came up with the idea. We ripped it. They wrote it, and it was really kind of vicious and edgy. And I and I had to kind of soften it just a little bit, even more. You know what I'm saying? So so, and the old man I heard, Mr. S, was watching that from the Waldorf and <laughs> saw the sketch with his daughter Tina and Nancy. And they said, and his daughter said, Joe, why don't you go in and surprise Joe on the air? Which I would have had a coronary. But I had to tell you, the old man when I when I, I got an invitation while I was at SNL. To, to go to a roast, to attend and, and be at the podium of a roast of Dean Martin, the master of ceremonies was Frank Sinatra. <laughs> that was the approval, see? Oh. And when, when I met him, he could not have been nicer. From the whole time, that I've, I've been with him a few times. I was never on the inside of the rat pack, you know? Mm -hmm. you know but he was mm -hmm. always so respectful. Always did he, so respectful. Did he say, maybe don't call me the old man? Maybe that's more <laughs> offensive than the sketch? You know, you know, <laughs> he was 52 at the time. Ladies. <laughs> <laughs> he was 52. You're like, it's nice to meet an old person like yourself. He's like, hey. Yeah. No, no. But you know what? Everybody who was around Mr. S, all the guys would call him the old man. The old, like the captain. That's like the admiral. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sure. And yeah. then, and then, no, this is this is the story. So when when he first saw me doing him, you know, you guys even know uh, Charlie Callis. Remember Charlie? Of Callis, course. Well, well, yeah, well, he was well, like well, Jerry well, Lewis's well. sidekick on uh, his talk uh, show. Uh, uh, he was Jerry Lewis, like another <laughs> extended <laughs> version, a crazy guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ga, 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 ga. yeah. Just to David, look him up. David, David you got to put that up. <laughs> Charlie Callis. Someone told him to play it bigger, and he never looked back. <laughs> I tell you, so Callis opened for <laughs> Mr. Ed. It was Atlantic City, you know, 1980-something. And then they're in the dressing room at Caesars. Mr. S is about to do a second show. And they're in the, the dressing room, about to step up to the stage. And on, in the dressing room on the TV, somebody had Saturday Night Live on. And I came on doing him. And it's the first time Mr. Sinatra saw me doing him. And the room grows silence. Ooh. Everybody goes, gosh, who's crazy enough? So Charlie Callis breaks the silence. He goes, what do you think, Captain? And uh, Mr. S looks at me doing him and he goes, hey, he's pretty good. The little prick. Like that, <laughs> yeah. which was <laughs> <laughs> it's the best answer. <laughs> what, what great life. But, but he didn't mind it. He, he got that it was respectful and it was, and it was all well, good. There was, so maybe even to this day. There, I, at that ebony and ivory thing it was kind of edgy because it was based on paul mccartney and you know, oh. it was about black and white getting together all that stuff and it was pretty it was pretty edgy with frank being the clueless you know but like the old italian guy the way they could be at that time you're black i'm white you're singing but at the very the very last thing you had frank say which i wonder if you kind of was sort of sweet and landed it completely different who cares or what did frank say at the end of that sketch 
God, you know, I got to tell you, I, I, and if folks watch, everybody's watching your podcast now, guys, I got to tell you, yes. that means so much to me what you just said, Dana, what you just said. Yeah. Because you do things on the air. You do things on the air, and and sometimes someone picks it up. Thank you for that. No, it was. I said, it, who it, cares, baby? Yeah, that yeah. changed cares, the whole baby? sketch, and it changed the whole vibe exactly. of Sinatra. He can do this and that, oh. and we all know that he was a champion for Sammy, and he wouldn't, you know, he, he was completely not that character. Yeah. And so that was nice at the end. It really made it a great. Thank landing. you for thinking of that. Social justice warrior he was. I mean, just for because folks yeah. don't understand when Mister F went to Vegas. That they and and he was playing the main room and he was playing with the Count Basie Orchestra, which was an all black orchestra. He had Quincy Jones mm -hmm. uh, arranging yeah. for him and conducting for him, and then and and Sammy would come on and they were staying on the other side of town. And, and Mister S said, "What is that? What are you going?" He had lunch with Sammy. Where are you guys staying? Where are you guys? He goes, "They're putting us. They're not. They wouldn't allow the performer to walk in to the front." People forget. And 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 Mister S said. Baldy goes, look, they don't go, they don't come in and you treat them exactly like you're treating me, that I'm not going on. And he really Yo, no, he, he, that. He, he, yeah. Yeah. There's a brilliant documentary on Sammy Davis Jr. It, it speaks a lot to how Frank was like, if you don't treat him yeah. like you treat me, I'm out of here. I'm doing you, doing him, doing him, whatever. But um, that's a fascinating part. So uh, curious about that cast. Now you and Eddie, and then who, what was the cast that came in with you? I, I, I just because... It was Brad, Brad yeah. Hall and J Julie Louise Dreyfus. Right? But that was, you know, well, they had, when we first went in, we had, uh, it was mostly Timmy Kazarinski and Mary Gross. And then uh, we had a guy, I think Tony Rosado joined us for a little while. Yes. There was some other folks from Toronto. Robin Duke is brilliant. Yes. Robin Duke is brilliant. He was just brilliant and wonderful and mary as well but robin and i we did the winers together we could riff and she, <laughs> yeah. she you know she's one of T toronto T toronto's second she, she's city, you great know what I'm saying? she's great and the winers was one of your reoccurring characters that yeah the audience would start mm -hmm. to applaud when you guys appear yeah yeah, you know. yeah 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 well i always said if, and if, if lauren was producing it would have been a movie you know, they could have. <laughs> you know, It'll you be know, called the Winers. Know, we'll do it at uh, Paramount. It'll be a forty. Three day sketches shoot. into one um, movie. Eddie will do a cameo, um, and we 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 go in June. Really? Now let's eat. <laughs> so, but you also you also yeah. had Jim Belushi as well. Was in that era. Is, so Jimmy came in later, later, and it was great, and and a great 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 actor, and it was just great. But but. Then they say we're bringing in Brad Hall, Gary Croker, yes, and we're bringing in Julie Louis Dreyfus. Mm -hmm. Now they were three young kids, and they could not have been more pleasant, more fun, more talented. They were great, but to this day, I feel guilty because it really was Eddie and I kind of hunkered down and write for ourselves. And if you didn't write for yourself back in the right. day, I guess it was pretty much with you guys. Yeah, you, you just didn't get on. You the figured end, you know? out pretty so, quick. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So, no one's really looking bad. out for you. Yeah. That's right. It's just like that, and I always felt bad that I should have helped. You know, I mean, you know, it doesn't make any difference now, but like Julia was so sweet and nice and great. She was she was 19 at the time and she was great. And I always felt we should have probably got her into the sketches more, you know, but I don't think she needed our help. When, when you look I know back. what did but she what did she do good. after SNL? <laughs> I mean, yeah, disappeared. Yeah. what has she really done? No, we hopefully will have her on as a guest, too. And, you know, but it's also a luck factor, like some sketch falls in your lap or someone writes you something good or you blow up on something. Uh, you know, Dana got is Wayne's world. And that thing blows up. He doesn't know for sure that's going to blow, you know? And so yeah. you're yeah. in different things. Some things you really think are going to work. They don't. Something else blows up. Yeah. I think it's hard though. If you don't write for yourself, for your own moves, like that's, you have to show them. Like I go, I'm funny. Mm -hmm. And they go, they don't know. Like, oh yeah. They're busy. You show them, you can do something even around the office and you do an impression or anything. And they go, we should put that in something. And then you go, okay, good. You know, that's, yeah, they, they need, you need to help them a little it's bit. It's like, so you and Eddie writers. integrated with writers. So you would instigate, you, this is stuff I do at the club, Eddie. And yeah. then you had a couple of writers who were like hungry for that. Cause when it works that way, and it, your rhythms, mm -hmm. it, your sensibility is already in, 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 enveloped into the sketch. And then they hopefully improve it, you know? So, yeah, but I, I get, and, and Eddie is, uh, I mean, force of nature. he's an absolute, he's a, he, he's, he is a force of nature, but he's a comic genius and, and it's effortless and it's instinctive. So we would be there. We'd be in uh, the producer's office, uh, one of the, and one of the producer's office. 
and he he was watching um, um, Mr. Rogers, you know, and he, and he goes, um, no, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a street version of this. And I look at him, he goes, I'm going to be Mr. Robinson. And I'm going to be, and, I, and he would come up with the concept. And he was just, and I remember one writer going, I don't know if that's going to work. And he would say, I'm doing it. Then he would say to me, he would say to me, I'm going to do Buckley. And I go, I'm sorry, eh? He goes, I'm, no, I'll do Buckley. Remember Buckley for the Little Rascals? And I would go, and I was like his older brother, because I had him by almost about 10 years. And, he, and I would say, Ed, it might be a little racist. You might want to just maybe not do that, you know? Mm -hmm. Bang. He didn't care. He went for it. And it was, I have to tell you, the joy of it, to be next to it, you know, to, to experience it, especially to be live, to be live. When the, I don't believe we had a delay back then. And, and, we, and, and to be next to Eddie, whether we were doing Ebony and Ivory, whether I was watching him doing Buckwheat, or whether we would do my favorite thing, we would do a Solomon and Pudge, the two old guys in the bar, which was kind of a bittersweet thing that was just a fill. It was meant to do a fill because they needed time right before one o'clock. And they would say, Eddie, Joe, just go up and do something. And Eddie and I just riffed. That it was, it was magic moments that I, I cherish forever. It was, and I told Eddie this when they gave him the Mark Twain Prize down there in Washington, that, and and Chappelle was there, and Arsenio was there, and Georgie Lopez was there, and it was it was like the you know except for me it was like the Mount Rushmore of comedy you know, and it, and, and everybody's going before we 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 we're, we're supposed to speak you know to, to Eddie at, at the Smithsonian the night before the event. What are we gonna say? And I remember Chappelle going. Hey, it'd be funny. What can I do? I said, guys, just speak from the heart, man. Just speak from the heart. And that's what I, when I got up, I said, Eddie, thank you for a great ride. Thank you for a ride of a lifetime. And, with, and, it, and it resonated. And we all had tears in our eyes. It was a beautiful thing. Out of comedy, you know, it's a, a lot of heart. It, the people may see us trying to be funny or silly or, you know, or outrageous, but I think we got a lot of heart and probably feel more than most, you know, guys. Well, and also say, state the obvious, and it comes up a lot on this podcast, just Rockefeller Center, 8-8, 17th floor, live television in New York City, me being from California. There's no more uh, viscerally intense thing you can do in show business. And everyone even moves on to movies or whatever they do. There still is just that. And we were talking to Eric Andre the other day, and he was like, how did you deal with the pressure? The pressure. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. did you get more comfortable? Did you just feel good when you're out there with Eddie? Like, we're going to kick ass because yeah. you've got. Yeah, great, great, great observation, David. It's exactly right. I was petrified the whole time. And I, <laughs> and, and I, I petrified and I just was always worried. And as a matter of fact, uh, the writers would always bust my chops because I was always so uptight on it's got to be perfect before the show. Before the show, I would say everybody be getting ready right after after the rehearsal, you know, the after shooting, you know, rehearsing. It's like 930 and it's over. And we go over the notes. I'd run down under the bleachers and I would go to uh, Al, the cue car guy. Uh, I would go I would go to Kevin, the cue car guy. And I would just go, let me see the cards, which was real. what a pain in the neck, Piscopo. I mean, really? But they, they did. No, they, I've they, done they, that. They ran. You know what I'm saying, David? Oh, yeah, they yeah ran. If you practice because you don't know where the sentence ends. And you're like, I want to get ready for exactly what it will be. So if that That's looks right. a little weird, I want to say that now. And then maybe That's they right. can tweak it. And then you go, ooh, could you go a little faster? Anything where you just go, it'll help. That's Whatever. Smart. It's so scary. Do anything you can. Yeah, I agree with you. We were live. We were live. No mm -hmm. safety net. It was mm -hmm. no safety net. I wanted to be perfect every single time. But I think working with Eddie, Timmy Kazaristi as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, that they were loose. You, when you're loose and you can have fun like that on stage, it was it was gold. It was yeah. just gold like that. That's where I relaxed in the arena, right right in the the belly of the beast, right live. We yeah. had, I mean, look, think of the numbers when we were on, guys. I mean, you know, was it eight million? Was it twenty million? It wasn't the thirty million they had, you know, originally, but they were a still lot. Still very very hard. big. Yeah, yeah. No, ca Dana, no cable. I TV. I worked with. Uh, yeah. I knew Tim Kazarinski a little bit He's because funny. yeah. We did something after that. He's a Chicago guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. I worked with him after that. And he was super cool, dude. Uh, I remember I had Best. a great time with him. And uh, we didn't even talk that much about SNL. Oh, I wasn't I wasn't on it yet. That's why. We, I did it before that, yeah. Wow. But Timmy, Timmy brought us all together. Timmy was like, he was the liaison between the producer. Because they would say things. And we would, you know, through animosity... <laughs> uh, comes creativity yeah. so you know so so if that you, what do you mean and then and then the worst was for me when they said okay all right you gotta we want you to do this sketch and you didn't want to do the sketch man you just knew it wasn't going to work mm -hmm. but you had to do the sketch and then you're waiting and then 
and then you do your your dress rehearsal, you know, and then you wait and you're in that. We, I just remember being, remember being crammed in, you know, 9 30 is coming to 10 o'clock. Oh my gosh, we're live in an hour and a half. And somebody said, Oh, the sketch is in that bad sketch that you're hitting. That oh, was tough. You got to go that self. You know, I have a, but we I have a question. <laughs> Joe, yeah. did, did you have, let's say you write the winers, or you write a first draft that gets through read through. Do you have a, do you have a Thursday read through? Uh, I mean, a, a rewrite day. We had a 16 hour rewrite day. You go through every sketch or did you just go off? Whoever wrote it, rewrites it. Whoever wrote it, rewrites it. That's okay. great. They, but there were, there were notes. There were notes. Okay. But then whoever, whoever wrote it, rewrote, whoever wrote it, if they had a rewrite, it was them. It was their piece. Right. Like Cause, that, cause sometimes when you gang bang it like that on a Thursday, it gets a little better cause you've got everyone around the table giving you their best joke for that. And you pick. And then you do it. That's the way we yeah, did like it when I was there, right, Dana? Work on the on it with you. Yeah, it's oh, Conan like O'Brien yeah. and Bob Just Odenkirk sitting around and a table Jack Handy, where everyone's trying uh, to talk, Downey, uh, play talk yeah, each other. Yeah, but great guys, writers. I, you know what? I love that. I wish we had it. So we because we didn't know what to do when we first went in, and and now and now we're all there and the new cast is together and we went in the back that 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 back writing area and then Dick Eversol said, "All right, I'm bringing back Michael O'Donoghue." And he was like a famous writer from the original cast. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I love, I love the, the play by play you're doing. Dana. I just try to set the that, table. That, I'm yeah. just thinking the person who doesn't know anything about this yeah. part of SNL. And also your it's era right. is like a missing link for us. I mean, it's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, it, it, well, go well, ahead. Well, we're sitting there. No, and, and now Michael, the, Michael O'Donnell is coming in. Oh my gosh. So now, and he, and, and he, and he was so theatrical and great. So we all waiting there. He makes an entrance and he's got a spray uh, paint can in, in his hand <laughs> of and he walks in, doesn't say a word and he shakes it and you can hear it shaking. Oh, and, and on the wall of the writer's wing, he wrote D A N G E or danger. And he went, show. Anyway, like that that's what the show lacks. And that's what we're gonna do. Like that, I went, whoa, man. <laughs> so then he would call us in. Listen, he would call us in, and he would, I'll tell you, these guys from that era were, and I mean this in the most respectful way, they were like off the charts crazy like that, you know? <laughs> and Michael was like, so listen, listen, guys, he sits me in the office. Now I'm new, and I and I don't even wanna be there because I don't, I, I've ruined the show so far. I don't wanna continue <laughs> with the show. But Donnie, he goes like this, listen, he's there, he's there, and he goes like this. Biscuit just he and I in the office one on one in one of those little producers' office. He goes, I don't get you. I don't think you're funny. I don't get it. Like that, like that. And I'm going, like, I'm going, like, oh. okay, well, I'll leave now. Yeah. Do you want me to go now? Like that. And then I I didn't I, like confront him. I said, you know, Michael, I agree with you. I, I don't think I belong here either. And I, I'm honored to see you, man. And and he goes like, then he softens up and he goes like this. Well, that Sinatra thing's pretty good. I like that Sinatra thing that you do. He goes like that. And after through all that adversity, that angst, that blood, sweat, and tears, it all worked out. By the way, and again, if I can, it, it's, I guess, stop me, but John Belushi was, when he, he was like, a, people don't understand, he was a comedy god. He was a god, man. He was, sure. It was like... And, and I and to me, Ackroyd was my guy. Danny, to this day, I have such immense love and respect for because Danny really was he was the, the he was the captain of that ship, I thought. But John was so great. So we did the shows, we start to catch on a little bit, and then John would come back and hang a little bit, and Danny Ackroyd came in. And these to me, man, oh, I was yeah. in the cop. It was it was it was Ackroyd and Belushi, yeah. man. Oh, and the yeah. Blues Brothers. Blues Brothers. Oh, so, and so, then, you know, just just every just kissing here and and Nixon, you know, pray for me, Henry. Remember yeah, that day? Oh, yeah, right? that he, he, he played Nixon Remember with a mustache. Danny? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And Danny was the epitome of, of, of how to execute a character. So then they go, they go, okay, we're going to an after party at Joe and Episcopal. They go, Episcopal, you're going to after party. We want you to go with us. So we went down to what was the precursor to the House of Blues. It was a hole in the mm -hmm. wall. I don't know if you got, I don't think it was there when you guys went in, no. but it was like in the village and it was just a dive and everybody was there. Gilda was there. Alan Zweig Bell was there. It was everybody. Mm -hmm. It's a Bennigan's like, oh. now. Yeah. And, I, and I'm going like, oh my gosh. And then, and then Belushi comes over to me uh, at, at just one-on-one -on -one and he goes, Piscopo. And, and, and he goes, come here. 
And so he walks me over to the jukebox and there's a big jukebox there. And he takes a quarter out of his pocket back in the day. He puts, he puts it in the, in the jukebox and he punches up Frank Sinatra, New York, New York. And he starts to sing it. And I'm doing dueling Sinatras with John Belushi at a bar in Greenwich Village. And it was uh, that those are the things that happen. Mm-hmm. And we're singing brand new news. And then to note, it, it became a moment at the party and everybody came around. Wow, look at John's with Piscopo. Look at his head. And as soon as that happened, it became a moment. I saw John and he he just shied away. He shrunk away and got out of it. All he wanted was a moment. And I felt bad. And I understood that when you think people want to be famous, I want to be famous. I want to be. It was not easy. And I, I saw a lot in Eddie, you know, too. When you got that big, it just wasn't easy. But I always appreciated that. Again, and it was the greatness, the, the humor of John Belushi, the boldness of John Belushi. But I tell you, he had a big heart. He had a big heart. And I saw it right there in that moment. How it was lovely. Very, very what a great. You got Eddie, you got Belushi, Ackroyd's out there. The, the fucking heyday of it all jesus hey can i can i ask can i ask a question, anything, anything. Ask a question? yeah we, we have we have no structure so, we don't know so, what we're doing <laughs> david david can i david tell me about if i may i would be i would be at uh i went to st Malachy's when i i was on broadway and i was across the street with st Malachy's, yeah. and and then they would tell me chris farley was always there at st Malachy. yeah oh right and then i'm in beverly hills and i'm out there and i'm at church and more than once and I forget if it was a Saturday night mass. And there's Chris Farley taking communion, walking like, like he just had partied all night. And I and then we saw each other. Like, Whoa. I said, hey, how you doing? I wish I did. I wanted to talk to him. Oh, I didn't I wish want to talk to him. No, I know. No. He would have loved but, it. He would have loved his it. His face was... Oh, old SNL to talk he was about had a lot. He, he was completely a, a full on Catholic and I mean David knows so much better than I did, but yeah, he was went to church yeah. all the time, right, David? Yeah, it was all night Saturday, uh, rap party, straight to church, mm-hmm. and then uh, yeah, and back to zero. He says, "I'm back to zero. Like I, he he go in there and confess and do all the things he did. And he goes, five Hail Marys later, I'm back to zero. I'm all good, going to heaven again." I go, "All right, well, let's ruin it again this week." Yeah, uh, yeah, he was very into it, and I think he would have really respected and loved to see anyone from SNL, especially you did so much. Oh yeah. He so would at his young age. Yeah. He would have been, yeah. All up in oh. your cast for sure. And you and Eddie. Oh. Yeah. And listen, it's fun for me and Dana because having you on and, uh, just hearing this stuff, it brings it all back and we're lucky to work with who we worked with. And then you got to work with people and you're part of it all. So we heard of your names while we were there, it's the same thing. You Absolutely. Know, you just hear about the cast before you. And I'm seeing you killing on SNL, doing characters and doing what I want to do, you know, before I was yeah. lucky enough to get there. Well, <laughs> and you know what, David, I remember we were at, uh, we were in uh, Hollywood somewhere or Los Angeles somewhere. And I was with my son years ago and you and it was a sushi place, great sushi place, uh, right from the Beverly Center. And you walked in, I said, hi, and you were very nice and very respectful. I pre- you know, you appreciate that. And my son was, of course, great to see, uh, oh, you know, the great David Spade. No, it was great. And then and then I remember this. I don't know why I remember this. But I told Dana this the other night, David, uh, when I was in my makeup chair, it was had to be rehearsal or we were doing a pre-shoot or something. And and I looked in the mirror and a kid stuck his head in and went, Joe, Joe, hey, I'm a big fan. Hi, my name's Dana Carvey. Well, I don't know why I remember that. So I, that was before. Dana, you were doing a series, you said. You were doing a sitcom. I had at a that little time? deal with oh, NBC. Yeah. I got cast on a show called One of the Boys. <laughs> Mickey Rooney was the star. Nathan Lane was the co-star. All of a sudden, I, I'm oh. living in New York in 1981, Bang, and I'm shooting this sitcom on the sixth floor. And of course, I was possessed by SNL. And I did go up to the on Thursday a couple times in the bleachers, watch you guys running stuff. And then we had the yeah. same Ooh. makeup artist. He would do your makeup on Saturday night or was in the, at least working Saturday nights. And I would do my Andy Rooney and do certain impressions. He goes, you got to tell Andy Joe. Rooney. But I thought I did an Andy Rooney, did it better or something. But I remember finding you somewhere, or Joe Piscopo's down this hallway. You know, it's like a big labyrinth. Yeah, I guess noticed. I, Hi, I'm Dana Carvey. I, I can't, I must've been really nervous because I was on- Ballsy, Dana. I was on this sitcom- <laughs> It was it was a death knoll. I mean, talk about it. <laughs> We're driving this <laughs> Scatman Carruthers stoned all day. Mickey with a thirty eight throwing it around the room. <laughs> a revolver. They're not gonna get me. Yeah. So I was in a madhouse, and seventy two months later, I got. You're like, hey, Joe. We're both in SAG. I wanted to say. 
<laughs> but any anyone who does this or anyone who's been to Saturday Night Live, you know, Tracy Morgan call he says, Hey alum, we're all alums because what yeah. is there, one six hundred and sixty yeah. of us? And it's almost fifty yeah. years that that yeah. that experience the pressure and the whatever yeah. the fleeny ass madness of this. There's a horse, there's uh people juggling. Now I'm now I'm throw a wig on me and push me out there. So um, well, we, we appreciate it, Joe. Thanks for uh, taking some time out for us and, uh, love chatting with you. Yeah. This with great respect and great love guys. Joe, Thank you, you so much yeah, you paint great, great pictures. You're a great storyteller. This was really fun. Yes. And thanks, thanks for filling we'll out. We'll see you out there. See you around campus. Okay, buddy. God bless. God bless. This has been a presentation of Odyssey. Please follow, subscribe. Leave a like, a review, all the stuff, smash that button, whatever it is, wherever you get your podcasts. Fly on the Wall is executive produced by Dana Carvey and David Spade, Jenna Weiss Berman of Odyssey, Charlie Finan of Brillstein Entertainment, and Heather Santoro. The show's lead producer is Greg Holtzman. <laughs>